<laughs> um, Morning, a, very, a very warm welcome to uh, the second day, the, the, the final day of the Business and Professional um, Development Program. And uh, I'm delighted that there are uh, a number of colleagues who are joining us online. So uh, a very special welcome to you uh, and a very special welcome to, to Joe, uh, who's going to be sharing the first session with Jenny uh, in, in, in a couple of minutes. Um, but what I just wanted to do was to pick up on um, two things that came out in yesterday's presentations, um, but also um, over the discussion at dinner last night. Um, so the first one was the, uh, I mentioned this book, uh, the first publication by the UK School Library, um, Library Association for Secondary School Libraries um, that identified uh, reference and inquiry as one of the three um, functions of a school library. And that was published in 1972. And that reminded me of an absolutely extraordinary book published by um, um, by Ruth Ann Davies called um, The School Library Media Program, Instructional Force for Excellence, uh, which was published in 1979. Um, and what I was reminded of in this was this passage where she writes, the central purpose then of this edition, which is the second edition published 1979. The first edition was published 10 years earlier in 1969, a vintage year, the year that I was born. Um, so I know exactly how many years ago that was. Um, but I think that the, the thing that is interesting is how far back this clarity of purpose exists. Um, and somehow I think the challenge for us is to, to rediscover and to recover that. But she writes, the central purpose then of this edition still remains constant with that of the first, to get the static out of the educational intercom so that the message can clearly be heard that today's school library and today's school librarian is a teacher whose subject is learning itself. Um, and for us to, to discover the, the confidence in ourselves, um, to be able to take ownership of that role and to enter into that role with our classroom-based teaching colleagues. Um, and then the second thing, and I think this was a, a, a real theme yesterday, all the way through into the evening, um, uh, an absolutely brilliant passage from the second edition of the IFLA School Library Guidelines uh, says, in deciding to use a process approach to inquiry-based learning, school librarians and teachers face the same fundamental issue. No matter the size of their library and the nature of its collections and technology, which is how to influence orient and motivate the pursuit of learning using a process of discovery that encourages curiosity and the love of learning. So that is our, our most important and our most urgent task and arguably our most difficult task. Um, a process of discovery that encourages curiosity and a love of learning. Um, and certainly I think that is a very, very um, good introduction to the talk that we're about to hear, um, the collaboration between Jenny, who was curriculum librarian at that point at Oakham School, and Joe, who was a teacher of A-level politics, so um, grade 11 and 12 uh, politics, um, that really does illustrate this in a very powerful way. So over to you, Jenny and Joe. Okay, thank you and um, welcome to this session on curricular inquiry and um, my colleague and Joe want to Joe and I want to explore some of the lessons that we learned um, over the course of a four-year collaboration on developing inquiry within a-level politics and um, 
I was re we are really privileged as librarians to be able to work with subject colleagues from across a wide range of different subjects. And it was a huge privilege to be able to spend all this time working with Joe, who he doesn't know I'm going to embarrass him like this, but he is absolutely an outstanding teacher and probably one of the most talented teachers that I've ever worked with. Um, very knowledgeable um, and very, very good with the students. So yeah, I can second that. <laughs> um, so over to you, Joe, to introduce yourself. Thank you. Um, I hope I live up to that. Um, so I'm a senior lead, senior lead practitioner uh, at Oakham School uh, and I'm in charge of initial teacher training as well. So very much um, focused on pedagogy and particularly for, for new teachers. Um, I've worked in schools uh, in the Midlands here and also in London where I trained uh, for goodness 11 years now and I've been at Oakham for seven years, four of which were, as Jenny said, uh, joyfully spent collaborating on the uh, inquiry that we're going to talk about today. Thanks, Jenny. OK, thank you. It's not working. Sorry, my presentation is just frozen. There we go. Um, so I was at Oakham School um, with Joe for, well, I, I was at Oakham School on and off for 13 years um, as latterly as curriculum librarian. Um, currently I'm curriculum librarian and EPQ coordinator here and also a science technician here at Blanchland. Um, I've been working in schools for, for around 20 years. I'm a pro professionally qualified librarian and a professionally qualified physics teacher um, and I was a founding member with Daryl on the Fossil Group website. So that's my bit of background. Joe. Thank you. So a bit of the context of the school and our examination system, just to uh, just to put the inquiry into context. And um, so Oakham School up in Rutland, uh, which is just to the east of Leicestershire, it's a co-educational secondary independent day and boarding school which since 2001 has offered students the choice of educational pathways here in our years 12 and 13, as you can see, between, I suppose, the traditional A-level BTEC pre-U and the uh, International Baccalaureate Diploma in the green. Um, and one of the key parts of our inquiry design that we'll talk about today is the, is the previous misunderstanding that the IB was the only place where inquiry could happen. Um, and in fact, we were looking at how we could move that perception and look at inquiry within the A-level route, the kind of peach route here on the screen. Um, the school has been on an inquiry journey since 2011 when Daryl um, as head of library and then Jenny coming back in as well, first developed Fossil, the framework of skills for inquiry learning, which I'm sure you've heard about. Um, although Daryl and Jenny's work with Fossil began with the extended essay, which is a key and compulsory part of the International Baccalaureate Diploma Programme, um, the library team has made considerable progress in collaborating with subjects across the school and working with plenty of colleagues, as Jenny said earlier, embedding inquiry into the curricula across the year groups. But as I said, in a system which has such a strong focus on external standardised testing along that peach route of GCSE and A-level. Um, teachers and librarians have often struggled to find the time and the space for inquiry. And the challenge for us here was to, to look particularly at GCSE and A-level where there was a perception that there was no time for inquiry. Thanks, Jenny. Um, the collaboration that we had began in the context of a big push within the school to promote understanding of fossil as central to inquiry based learning as sent well um, within the school, but also we were looking at really promoting um, inquiry as a stance, inquiry as a way of thinking and a way of teaching rather than a process that you go through um, and not just this cycle of inquiry. Um, but also a uh, framework of skills that lies behind it, really, really important underlying skills framework based on um, Barbara Stripling's work with the Empire State Information Fluency Continuum, um, and also underpinned by this range of graphic organisers. So um, these are, we'll come back to these later, but tools for thinking with, and really a way to um, 
support students through these different processes that they're going through. And we believed that the colours that we'd used in the fossil cycle were, were very important for helping students to understand and locate themselves in the process. So one of the things we were doing in the school was um, taking inspiration from these graphic organisers that Barbara and her team had developed and um, pulling them into the, the fossil cycle and pulling them into um, the different colours that we were using and making those um, distinct for different departments, making tailored resources for, for particular departments. And Joe approached me after a teach meet that I've been leading um, with his suggestion that um, essays within politics were actually mini inquiries, even though you weren't necessarily going through the whole um, traditional research process. And we talked about collaborating to support students with their essays and to develop those those really important higher thinking skills and all the metacognitive skills that they're going to need every time they write an essay. Jo. So when Jenny and I first put our heads together uh, on this, uh, in the first instance, it was very much to utilise the inquiry cycle in preparation for and then the writing uh, of a 30 mark essay, which um, in the LXL uh, specification is kind of the most demanding, the biggest essay in A-level politics by making more deliberate the thought process of students and also by scaffolding this process of how do I create an essay much earlier in the politics um, syllabus. And as you can see here, um, the graphic organisers and the colour coding that Jenny has spoken about were absolutely crucial in highlighting the different stages of the process and uh, the way that skills are important to the way that students go about it. Now, the main, the main skills that my students, I felt, struggled with at the time um, to embed in their external exam performance were evidence analysis and evaluation, um, and particularly analysis and evaluation of the higher order skills, what we call assessment objectives two and three. And so we put these central to our um, our framework design here for the students. We really made that quite explicit. On top of the wrap, uh, the essay planning wrap, I wanted to bring inquiry more explicitly into my teaching. Um, and I chose a topic called pressure groups um, in the politics course, which normally falls at the time when students are just about ready to start to bring knowledge and skills together. Whereas before in their first year of A-level, perhaps we're just doing little bits here and little bits there of each discreetly. Um, so the unit of pressure groups requires students to recall evidence from a range of case studies on a variety of pressure groups and then use that knowledge to critique the group's methods and effectiveness. My worry was that in previous years, I'd always delivered this in a very lightweight fashion. I, don't, I didn't feel as, as though I, I was scaffolding um, or structuring research for students. I felt that that led to students skimming the surface of their understanding and using sources that were subjected to little, if any, uh, analytical discrimination. In turn, Jenny and I wanted our collaboration uh, on both the essay wrap and the, and the topic inquiry into pressure groups to debunk some assumptions about inquiry learning. Um, and one of the main ones that was, was that inquiry learning is finding out by yourself. Whereas, of course, the fossil cycle helps students to find out for themselves um, with the expert guidance of Jenny and myself as librarian and teacher um, and the way that we designed, not just delivered um, the inquiry to them. Thanks, Jenny. So in terms of um designing the wraps you can see here we've got um, I've got the front covers of, of two different wraps for two different types of essay we made that very deliberate use of colour um, to signpost the different stages um, and one of the things we were quite keen to do was to have the sense of um, inquiry as a cycle and very often we talk about inquiry starting with connect and going all the way around and ending with reflect but actually it's a complete circle and that reflect moves on back into connect to the next um, cycle. So we wanted to start the wrap with the reflection, with the targets that students had set themselves in their last essay. So it meant that very often when, when you mark student work, you give them targets, you tell them what they need to go on and do, and they file that away. And next time they start, they're not thinking about that. So we wanted them to start with that, 
and then launch into the inquiry that they were doing. Um, you can see here that we did connect and wonder the first two stages very differently on these two different wraps. So the, um, political, the, the pol political ideas one on the left there, um, the connect is very structured. And we were asking them to look at um, which particular um, ideologies they were looking at in this particular essay, which particular concepts were important, and to divide those things up. Whereas on the right hand side in the UK and global politics, we left it very free. We wanted them to essentially just make a mind map, all of the things they already knew about this topic in one colour, and then change colour pen to add in the questions and the things that they needed to find out. So the investigate stage, um, when I initially designed the wraps, because I'm a librarian and I'm used to, to doing inquiry with lots of um, research and investigation involved, I put in a section about where you found your information, um, which books did you go to, what extension materials did you use. But we realised that actually for these kinds of essays, they're largely using their class notes. They might go to other things, but actually this isn't a full-blown inquiry. We don't expect them necessarily to be using lots and lots of different resources. So I slimmed down that section to just a set of tick boxes so that the, the teacher could see um, what they'd been using and see where they had gone beyond and had a chance to make a record of stuff that they'd done that had gone beyond. Um, the wraps were designed as a single double-sided A3 piece of paper that they could fold around their essay. And the most important bit for us was the bit in the centre which was um, scaffolding the um, the analysis and evaluation skills. So we made that the biggest section. Um, and I think it's important here to, to use Barbara Stripling's language of graphic organisers, that it's not a worksheet, it's not a lot of boxes that you just fill in exactly what you've been told to fill in and that's it, job done. It's a tool for thinking with. It's something that allows you to spend time developing your thinking and understand what you're doing. Um, and actually what we found as well on the back here at the top, that top section is for students to record the time that they spent in each bit of the process. And in asking them to do that, in asking them to fill in the central section, we slowed them down and we got them to spend a lot more time thinking before they started writing about what they were planning to write before they actually started writing. And a lot of the, the raps that I've seen um, they're almost half and half in terms of the time they spend planning and the time that they spend writing. The middle section there, this purple section, um, is whether we wanted them to estimate what mark we thought they would get, they thought they would get before they started, before they handed it in, and why they thought they'd get that, because that helps us to understand whether they understand the marking criteria. Students often know where, how well they've done before they, before they hand it in, and they often have good reasons for that. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they think they've done a brilliant analysis and that shows us they don't understand what the word analysis means and that's where we need to focus our time. Um, teacher would then mark it and they'd look at what they needed to do to develop. And finally, we went back to revisit those targets. So did they achieve the target they had from the previous essay and what are they going to do for their next essay? So over to you, Jay. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I, I mean, I can't emphasize enough how important these wraps are today and four years ago uh, and the impact that Jenny has had on students now for as long as I teach because of these wraps. They are amazing. Um, one of the things that we considered with these wraps, and as Jenny says, this is not just a writing frame, do this. And I know that we've got the peel there, and particularly in that central construct sheet, that's actually evolved in uh, lots of different ways for lots of different questions. And I've changed peel and, and all of the rest of it, although we've left the cute orange peel at the bottom. Um, the, the key here is that we've also thought about student cognitive load as well. And the fact that students can faff they're great at procrastination and one of the things they procrastinate with is perhaps how they structure things and we've we've given them that scaffold and what we found is we by introducing this much earlier on in courses and for actually to help students think about how they think about essays so that metacognitive ability i can by by the time we, we reach the second year of the politics course 
we pretty much can withdraw these because students have already found that this is this has become second nature, um, which is amazing. Um, and it, and it, you know, I, the students do appreciate it. I want to just make a brief comment that always makes Jenny and I laugh about broccoli in a moment. Uh, the students do massively appreciate it, despite sometimes moaning about the fact that they have to. We force them to slow their thinking down, and it's good for them. Um, so our, our reflections on on the wraps early on, this first iteration of the wraps, uh, we refer to as our broccoli moment, which is when one of our students um, said, "I don't like it, but it works." She didn't like the fact that she had always been allowed to kind of write essays loosely and do what she wanted. Um, and perhaps that's why the marks were not as good. When we gave them a framework which ran counter to her habits, she suddenly found that in fact that she was able to take the strain off some of the the extraneous thinking that she had to do before about essays and she could really focus on what makes a good politics essay. We saw students meticulously going through the stages and uh, uh, thinking that were required to write this essay and, and, and to plan it um, prior to that. The wrap, as I said, is, has become such a key element of all the essay planning in you know, every aspect of our course. Uh, the colour coding stands out as well and has made its way into lots of other um, independent sheets um, that the students are now very much au fait with. Um, and we have seen marks go up earlier in the course as well, as I said, because of these wraps. Um, I'll mention them too as part of our freshman group inquiry um, later as well. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so the, the second phase of our collaboration was a more traditional inquiry unit. Um, and Joe was really keen to, to collaborate on radically overhauling the teaching of this A-level unit because it involved students needing to um, gather information on a lot of different case studies and to be able to bring that back and use it in the exam. And he felt in the past that the approach had been unsuccessful, fairly surface level, and they weren't internalising these case studies in a way that they needed to. Um, a new politics specification on human rights groups um, and participation in protection of human rights put that really at the forefront of the unit. And we wanted to find a way to embed the case studies and get the students to really engage with them. And it was also an opportunity to prove that teaching content through inquiry not only can be very successful but sometimes can be the best way to do it because often um, we come across this content skills debate and inquiries for teaching skills and if you need to teach con content then we'll just do that directly and actually it's it's a false debate and there are particular units but actually across the board inquiry is a very effective way to teach content as well as skills. Joe. Thanks, Jenny. I'd, I'd go further than that. I would say that every new topic that I go back and tweak or plan um, is pretty much now inquiry based at A level um, because of this first one that Jenny and I did. Uh, so we decided to to break pressure groups down, uh, the pressure group topic down into two separate inquiry um, cycles, so two separate fossil designs, if you like. So the first one would be on what makes pressure groups successful and whether they are successful. And then the second one will be looking at pressure groups um, and their impact on democracy and human rights, as that was far more explicit in the curriculum content of the new specification. Now, going through it twice um, with slight differences in the product creation of in the express in the pink stage uh, means that we would have the ability to reflect and then have another go. Um, and so with the students, which was really important as well, the students would become very familiar with colour coding and the different uh, resources that we use, the different graphic organisers that we use as we went through. So this double design was good, not just to cover the course, but actually good um, for thinking about the process. So the first cycle then, um, cycle one, which is on whether pressure groups um, are successful, successful and what makes them successful. Um, students needed to understand what success looks like for a pressure group and which factors are most important in bringing that about. We started by using a reputable extract from the Politics Review uh, magazine with a scaffolded sheet here, as you can see, uh, to elicit questions and links to prior knowledge. Um, 
and introducing possible success criteria on the right hand side there for pressure groups. There was also a taught element in this connect and wonder stage from me. Um, as we were saying, inquiry does not mean go away and do it for yourself. This this doesn't change the fact that I was still the teacher. Um, and I, I was really aware that there was some there was some key content in terms of concepts and vocabulary that I really needed to introduce to make the overall inquiry successful. So they did need me still inquiry still involves the teacher. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you. And um, so the the express stage of our inquiry, we were going to ask them to do a debate, an Oxford style debate where you have um, two students debating against each other. Um, on a motion. So the motion we gave them was this house believes that a particular assigned group, so something like Amnesty International, is a successful pressure group. Um, and it, it was very, very interesting, certainly in the first year, to hear students arguing quite passionately, for example, that Amnesty International is not a successful pressure group um, and doing a really good job on their side of the debate. Um, they were not told at the beginning of the inquiry which side they were going to be on and that was really important for us because we wanted them to have a balanced um, case study that they could use looking at both sides of that argument if we told them right at the beginning which side they were going to be on they would focus on it being successful or it being unsuccessful um, the focus investigative skills for us um, for this stage were source location and evaluation and actually, because we hadn't told them which side they were going to be on and because they were going to need to debate, that evaluation became a key part of the inquiry and something that they would really need um, in order to, to do it successfully. And often we find that's a, a kind of also around you need to make sure you're using good sources because it's important to use good sources. But here um, they knew they were going to need to stand up and defend those sources. So in the debate, they were going to have to um, listen to what the other person was saying, think, oh, I found that source and that had issues. So I can raise those issues that source had and the other person was going to need to defend their source and why it was a good source to use. So it really brought it to the fore for them. Um, we used prep testing, which is a, a very, very common um, method of source evaluation. Um, and I went through it as a worked example in a lesson. So the, the first time through I taught this, um, it's quite an involved rubric and one of the criticisms that's sometimes made of, of teaching prep testing to students is that it's too detailed, too much, they're not going to spend all their time looking at all these different criteria. And I was very keen to work through them the idea that the idea of a kind of light touch crap test, that if you know all the criteria, if you understand what they are, you can see very quickly which ones apply to your particular source and which ones you're going to need to be very careful of with your particular source. So you don't necessarily need to sort of robotically go through all of the criteria with all of the sources. The other thing that was important to me at this level was to teach it using a real life source, um, because lower down the school, I'm, on occasion, I'm, I'm very comfortable and happy with using some of these sites that are set up specifically for teaching this. You probably come across things like the the tree octopus and things like that, where the site is a deliberate fake set up for students to explore. But that makes it really difficult for them to look around about what's being said on the Internet about the site and how do I evaluate a real life site? So I chose a real life site and um, Breitbart was a, a very rich vein of, of articles for this because it um, is very, very plausible, um, but it's also a very extreme right wing American sites um, and it's relatively easy to find the issues with it, but it is a real site. And one of the students said to me after we'd done all the evaluating, um, they wanted to give it a higher crap test score because they've worked so hard and they've done such a good job of, of making a plausible article. And to explain to these students that it's not it's not about the effort they've put in, it's about how trustworthy this source is. Um, it was also really important to me in this first year to empower Jo as the teacher. Um, I only taught this lesson in the first year and beyond that he taught it because I think sometimes as librarians we can be quite possessive that this is our bit to teach and um, the teacher will do, do their bit and we'll do our bit 
um, and we mustn't tread on each other's toes. But part of my job is professional development and part of my job is empowering teachers to do this because then they'll bring it into everything they do, not just the lesson when I'm standing in front of them. Um, and by empowering Joe to do this, and he does it very, very well, um, it means I can go out and support other teachers. It means I can develop his inquiry more. I don't have to be physically in his classroom every time. Although the voice of the librarian is helpful, and being physically in the, li in the classroom for some of the inquiry can be really helpful. Um, so this is one of the other sites that I use quite a lot um, when we're evaluating sources, this media bias fact check, because for media sources, it gives students a very quick tool um, to go out something external to the site, so they're not just looking at the site itself, um, to evaluate media sources and see um, where it sits politically and um, how it's doing in failing fact checks and things like that. The other tool that we use in almost every inquiry that we do is this investigative journal um, because it slows students down. It encourages them to find information. They are very welcome to copy and paste information into that red left hand side, but then they have to think about it and they have to think about why they've chosen that information and what they're going to do with it. And at the bottom here, we have some kind of comment on the source. So when they might have to argue for or against the source, that's where they put their comments from the crap test. And they, they did a really, really good job of um, using this to support their thinking in the inquiry. Go. Thank you. Yeah, the, the investigate stage was really rich and I would say push students to undergraduate level in pretty early on um it was brilliant um and boosted by the expert librarian being there and showing me how to do it for sure jenny's being modest um the construct sheet then um is vital because students as jenny said only discover which side of the debate they will argue for at this stage and really it's only partially through this stage it's not even at the beginning because i want them to consider both sides of this sheet um equally um, before they kind of punt for one side. Um, so they don't yet know whether they're going to say that, for example, Liberty Pressure Group is successful or unsuccessful. Um, now, the pairing is also worth mentioning briefly here. Um, I did need to pair students in a differentiated way because I wanted to make sure the debates were balanced. We we're also aware that certain groups were more challenging than others in the investigate stage. So, for example, the Howard Lee for penal reform is tough to research and Jenny and I actually had to dig around quite a lot just to scaffold that a little bit more but I would I tended to give that to the students who I knew um, had slightly higher skills already at that stage. So this blue construct sheet here um, it asks students to preempt possible rebuttals and counter evaluations by organizing their investigative findings. Um, Jenny and I divided the success criteria on the left hand side up so that students could input their research in a logical order. Again, we don't want faffing around. These are the things that the exam board actually says do affect success or lack of success. And so here they are for you. And then the students organize their thinking around that. Then the central darker shaded blue um, analysis column brought students to the important higher order skills that I was really um, focusing on at that stage. Um, and also that students would need to think about a lot more when we got to essay planning with the wrap. Um, again, this is alongside the wrap, I'd say that this construct stage is, is, a, is an element that appears in every single topic that I now teach, as do, in fact, every, at every other stage. It's just the construct bit becomes almost the kind of the student crib sheet of this is now all of my thought uh, on this topic organised, and that's the bit that they often come back to. Um, we then move to the express stage of our first cycle then, and this is the fruit of the whole inquiry for the students. This is the bit that where they see everything um, being produced. Um, it was genuinely impressive and we had our worries and we didn't really know how it would go massively on the first iteration. But these Oxford style debates um, on whether pressure groups are successful, whether they're given pressure group is successful, um, were really impressive. It's also um, worth noting on the right hand side here that we we thought carefully about audience participation. So the audience members participated too. They use this adapted Cornell noting sheet here um, to take down the key arguments on each side that we've got on the right hand side there. 
pressure this pressure group is or is not successful um and they also needed to reflect on the process um as well as the knowledge that they were being given as well um, and what we did here is the blue construct section of this Cornell noting sheet students could come back to afterwards um, to categorize their thinking. The red bit was what they focused on during the debate and Jenny will cover that a little bit more in a few moments, but very much with cognitive load in mind. We did find, I think it's fair to say that this stage really surprised us. Students were more keen than I expected to teach the audience as well as critically analysing the quality of one another's sources and critically analysing the strengths and weaknesses of one another's arguments. There was a real sense of I want to teach my peers. Um, I want to show people in a good ordered framework of what I have found in my investigation. Um, and also there was an inbuilt accountability to this that was really important. Um, students knew they had to be fully prepared for this stage that's prepared with two sides of uh, the argument, with lots of analysis and evaluation, with proper source crap testing, because they knew that if they didn't create a good debate, they would maybe look daft, but their peers would struggle too. And so there's that double layer of accountability that worked and continues to work really well. Um, and also the, Jenny and I, through our collaboration, we made it a safe level of accountability. It wasn't something terrifying, we were there to help them through it as well and facilitate that. Another thing to note with the express stage is that obviously after one year of this, um, we were hit with COVID and lockdown. Um, that obviously that obviously forced us to think about whether this would work online, and it did. It was potentially even more impressive online without the constraints of standing physically in front of your class and and all of the the teenage worries that that comes with it was even better online this debate stage um than in person which is which was brilliant um thank you jenny we then moved on to the final or i suppose if you're thinking about it the stage before we start again reflect stage um now this stage is a great chance to think about the process for us and for the students um we use this stage very much to pause and to consider how the first cycle went as a whole. And at the same time, students would, as we see here, they would reflect on their performance and the performance of others. They would think about the success and lack of success of pressure groups. They would then go away and they would start to plan using the essay planning wrap, of course, um, an essay on whether pressure group, their pressure group is successful or not. And they worked collaboratively after the debates on, on locating the best arguments that they had heard and noted down in their Cornell noting sheet to construct a model essay that I would then um, give them feedback on. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so in terms of what we learned through that, that first cycle, um, we did find the whole unit, the entire unit of two cycles was only three weeks long. Um, so we packed a lot into it and actually um, moving the students very deliberately through the stages, giving them a timetable and telling them in this session you are going to be doing investigate, um, really kept them on track and helped them to, to keep up the pace and to move through at a rate that was going to work. Um, and the colour coding helped very much with that as well. Um, but I think our biggest lesson from this first year of the cycle um, was awareness of student cognitive load. And in the debate where we were asking them to make notes on other people's pressure groups and to, to listen carefully and to make notes as they were talking, we had provided this pink sheet on the left, um, which was very similar. It was actually a, a mirror of the construct sheet that they'd used to put together their own debate with all of the different sections that they needed to think about, the wealth and resources and size and membership and all of that. Um, and we thought that would be really helpful for them to, to structure the notes that they made. But actually, the cognitive load for that was much too great. Um, it's very, very hard to listen and think, OK, which box should I put that point that somebody's just made into? Um, so for the second year, we completely overhauled that sheet. You can see we've, we changed it completely to the sheet that's on the right um, into a Cornell note taking sheet. And the only decision they had to make was, is this argument for or against this group being successful? And that was really easy to make anyway, because they knew the students arguing for and the students arguing against. So if it's this student talking, it goes in the top box. If it's that student talking, it goes in the bottom box. And 
that made their note making much easier and much more successful. They could spend more time listening and less time thinking about the, what they were going to write. And then they had some really strong notes that they could use um, to write their essay because they, after the debate, they could go and have a look and fill in these blue sections on the left and at the bottom where they're pulling out keywords or comments or questions, but that all happens when they're not needing to sit and listen. So that student eye view was, was really, really important. The other thing to notice about these sheets is the colour change, because we were thinking about the student themselves making notes, although for the students talking, they're in their express stage, a student making notes is actually back in Investigate, because they are using their peers as a resource. So they are back in a, a researching note making stage. So we made the colour appropriate to the student who was actually using the resource. Then um, into the second cycle. So we've been through one cycle already. We're about a week and a half in. We go into the second cycle. Um, and in the first year, again, this was a, a major change that we made in the second year. In the first year, the second cycle, we were asking them to design their own pressure group for the, the second bit so they could really get to grips with the um, the things that make pressure groups successful. If you were starting a pressure group, what would it be like? How would you fund it? Those kinds of things. They loved it. They had great fun. They produced some beautiful creative stuff, but they didn't learn very much new. And we felt we could do a lot better in terms of effective use of their time working towards the exam. So the second year, we overhauled that completely. We used the second stage of the inquiry to focus on different types of pressure groups. We looked at cyber activists and trade unions and think tanks and lobbyists. And we found an external competition, um, the Orwell Youth Prize for political writing. Um, it's a really, really interesting competition. It was happening about the right time of year. And we used this to ask them to write an essay for that competition instead. Um, and that was much more effective in terms of what we were trying to achieve. Joe. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so we started, as with the first cycle, we started the second cycle with a bit of direct instruction and again with a rectable article prompt from the Politics Review magazine. This is an updated uh, 2022 version of that very article um, on whether pressure groups promote democracy or not. Um, now, this Connect and Wonder stage again had some really complex and very synoptic concepts that needed covering elitism and pluralism, for example. Uh, being being amongst them, um, they the students needed to know these concepts and and how you might subcategorize them into what they look like in order to then evaluate the democratic nature of pressure groups later down the line, and so they really did need this source at the beginning. Um, I also taught the distinctive subcategories of pressure groups for students as well at this stage, and they were trade unions, think tanks, lobbyists and cyber activists, which the exam board stipulates do need to be mentioned now on their own rather than as just under an umbrella of pressure groups. Uh, and I used a collaborative stations approach uh, using a variety of different reputable media sources, some from me, uh, some video clips, some journal extracts. Um, and students then work together to get the basics um, of the Connect and Wonder stage on those groups. Um, this cycle, as we said, it would follow a very similar structure as cycle one. It would have the fossil cycle very much there to guide us. The colour coding would be the same as well. So we can, we, we're now at a stage where students are beginning to um, revisit and, uh, and re-identify, oh, this is where I'm at. So this is probably what I'm thinking and feeling at this stage. This is where I'm going. Um, which was really useful. Thanks, Jenny. So in the investigative stage of the first cycle, we were focusing on students locating and evaluating sources. Three weeks isn't very long for two cycle stages, not necessarily very long for one if you're going to, to spend a lot of time investigating. So we had a different focus in the second stage and um, finding appropriate sources is challenging and it takes time and particularly for young people it's challenging and it takes time so what we wanted to do in the second stage was to provide them with a curated set of resources that they could use and let them focus on finding information within those sources which is a whole skill in itself um, so i support in terms of the, the background support we supported the whole unit 
um, with a LibGuide. I'm sure most of you, certainly all the, all the librarians here, will have come across um, specialist library website building software. Um, so we supported it with that. You can see we had tabs for all of the different areas of the, um, the two stages of the cycle. Um, but it was really important for this stage because different students were going to need different resources and they needed them all together in one place where they could find them really easily. Um, so I made a page for each of the different types of groups, the trade unions, think tanks, cyber activists and the, the lobbyists and corporations. Um, and I gathered those resources together. On the right hand side of all my guides, I always put um, download sheets that they might need. So um, anything they might have been given on a piece of paper in the classroom, I always put as a download on the guide as well. So if you've lost your, your graphic organiser, you can always find another one. Or for a lot of these students, they want to work with them on screen because they're working with online sources. Piece of paper is not necessarily that useful to them. Um, I divided my page into to three different sections, which is really, really easy to do. It's one of one of the very useful things about the LibGuide software. It lets you mirror pages in between. Um, so they had resources for specific named groups. Each student was told which group they were going to be investigating. But there were also resources for that particular umbrella bunch of organisations. So here it was think tanks and then general resources that apply to everything. And then as a librarian, it was really, really important to me to um, model good information seeking behaviour. So even though I've supplied them with the resources, I wanted to explain to them why I'd chosen these resources. Um, so you can see there's there's a tab there for each of those organisations. This is the British Medical Association tab. But next to each resource, there's something that tells the student why I think this is a suitable resource for them to use rather than just the librarian gave it to me. It must be fine. Um, and you can see I, I've also put some links to how I found that information. I've told them what the political leaning of the organisation is, which is very important in a politics course. Um, and I've given them a reference, even though citing and referencing wasn't a big deal. Um, in this particular inquiry, it wasn't one of the skills we were teaching. It's really important that they understand that referencing your sources matters. So I made it really easy for them. I gave them an APA reference and they could just copy and paste that into their work. Um, one of the things I think as, as a school librarian, I, I feel a real pressure to make sure that my students are using books because they will default to the internet. But actually, sometimes it's important to say for this particular inquiry, books are not necessarily the most useful source. Um, and you can see here, I, I recommended the odd book, but actually most of these are websites and I'm very comfortable with that because for this particular inquiry, um, it's the most useful thing for them to do. Um, during the, the lockdowns in 2020, it meant they had access to absolutely everything. And even this book was available online in, in 2020. Um, and finally, I was providing them with some, this one was a very long report, much too long for them to want to read the whole thing, providing them with skills to search within that, um, giving them some information about what pages might be useful, but also um, teaching them about the shortcuts that they can use to search within that. Thanks, hey, Janet. Um, so the product, the, um, the express of cycle two would be to submit the Orwell Prize um, style essay to their peers um, so for this we we again we we helped to scaffold student thinking with the left hand side of this construct sheet here um, by giving them the subcategories that one might consider when looking at a pressure group and their and, and its impact so the main skills that we wanted to see here were to apply the knowledge from the sources that jenny and i had curated in an article that would then showcase their higher order skills um, because politics is very much all about persuasion in the essays as well as in real life, um, we wanted them to think about that, the analysis and the evaluation. So this construction was very much an organisation of the knowledge um, that they had gleaned so far. Um, we also were not as prescriptive on um, a structure. We knew that students would probably refer back to the Peel style structure as their default. Um, but this task allowed a more free approach to structure and form um, and therefore students could could be creative and were creative. Thanks Jenny. 
For the express stage, you'll notice here we actually used a construct sheet because again, we were doubling the express stage up as 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 both the student expression of their article, but also of them organizing their findings from their peers. And so we we ummed and ahed, but we decided to color it construct because they were constructing from a source in front of them um, into a structure that was already provided here with the goals, funding, organisation and tactics on the left hand side. Um, now, because we were clear from the beginning that we wanted our express stages for both cycle one and cycle two to be a little bit outside the box and not just be a usual run of the mill presentation, um, we did we did think outside the box a lot more. Um, the debate is something that, although I teach politics, I'd never thought of as a key almost assessment point, um, and I do that a lot more now. And equally, I'd never thought about sharing essays in such a, um, I suppose, such a such a big way um, as every student creating one for one another to read. Um, so we were we're being demanding here, so we knew we needed to give them a bit of a structure. Um, we told students that their Orwell Prize article must do the talking for them. They would need to be left on desks. We made the room into a gallery of Orwell Prize inspired articles and students weren't allowed to stand and uh, kind of describe and narrate their article. They would actually go around as audience members and read one another's articles um, at each little station for trade unions, cyber activists, lobbyists, etc. And students would take around this A3 construct sheet and they would consider which findings would, would be most useful that for, for, that for them as evidence um, when they came around to writing an essay on whether this pressure group was good for democracy, successfully protecting rights uh, and big evaluative questions such as that. Thanks, Jenny. And then um, we moved on to reflect and again we were we did actually want to reflect on two different things here, I suppose. We wanted to think about who should be entered for the prize. That's the, uh, that was kind of our focus um, at the bottom. But to get to that judgment, students thought not only about the article in terms of looking good, being accessible to read, they were also tuned into which articles provided the information that they needed for their own future essay writing success. Um, which they would have to do, they'd have to write that essay after this. Um, so they were they were thinking again, not just about skills, if you like, of presentation, but about the knowledge together. Thank you, Jenny. OK, so in terms of um, what we have got from this and what we've learned overall, um, I think one of the big things for me was that it was a really good example of embedding skills within a subject and actually um, between us, we were improving student skills, but we were also improving their subject knowledge and they weren't separate things. Um, I think it really is a case study that debunks this, this skills knowledge debate. Students need both. It's really important both for their general life skills, but actually for what they're doing in their subjects. They need both types of skills and the, and the knowledge. Um, for me, it was really helpful because I got to spend lots and lots of time with Joe, really understanding what the requirements of the exam board were and how we could support students with those. Um, but I think overall, um, the most important thing about this was that we had joint goals. We didn't have separate agendas. It wasn't a sense of I'll give you some books if you let me come into your lesson and teach some information skills. Um, and similarly for Joe, it wasn't a sense of I really need access to your resources, so I'll give you a little bit of time. We, our goal from both of us was what the students were going to get out of it. And we both learned a lot from each other. And Joe is an absolutely outstanding teacher. And I've learned an awful lot about teaching and about politics, as well as about um, embedding that into, into inquiry. So it was, it was very fruitful collaboration and it provided a springboard for a lot of other things that happened within the school. Jo. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so just to talk about that kind of false dichotomy again briefly that we were trying to debunk before I look at the impact on, on students as well. Um, it is important to emphasise, I think, that the approach to the pressure groups unit and indeed the essay planning wrap was not me to change my entire teaching style, but it was a change of stance instead. 
um, inquiry based learning does involve some direct instruction and that our collaboration um, hopefully didn't just benefit students in the school, um, but it should also discredit this false dichotomy between traditional versus progressive or, or knowledge versus skills or, or whatever you want to call it. It happens at the same time and that's what the, these inquiry, the inquiry cycles have shown. Um, with my subject teacher hat on, it was equally uh, enlightening and rewarding to work with, uh, with Jenny. Um, the the brain power and creativity of librarians um, must just be unparalleled. Um, although, of course, you need the boring bloke who needs the politics specification in their head and what the students need to know. Um, you know, thinking about how the, these sheets are designed, thinking about how the, the kind of meta approach to the cycle overall um, couldn't have been done without Jenny. Um, and it's had a great impact on students. Marks have definitely gone up and gone up earlier in the course because of things like the RAP and because I've built inquiry into more topics earlier. Um, ret the retention of knowledge is much better because they have these frameworks here um, to organise their thinking, to think about their thinking, maybe to siphon off the most important bits and leave the other bits behind, which helps then later down the line for revision. The construct sheet and the reason I've chosen this um, this blue construct centre of our wrap as the one to show at the, at the very end. This is a mainstay and it's not just a mainstay in my subject of politics now, it's being used across subjects, economics, PE, geography, drama. Um, there are, and there'd be even more if it wasn't for COVID because we had a whole collaboration just rolling it out there. English are looking at it as well. So there's, it's benefiting students across the school. Um, and we hope that we've modelled today the potential of a teacher librarian collaboration. It goes beyond the transactional relationship. As Jenny said, it relies on the expertise of me and it relies on the expertise of, of Jenny. Um, and the collaboration with Jenny has improved outcomes um, for students. It's improved my practice as a teacher no end. It's impacted immeasurably on um, everything I look to plan. Um, and it's certainly benefited the wider school community. So hopefully we've given you a good um, kind of snippet of a successful collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, I know um, we've, we've got a couple of other presentations to do and I will be around um, after this if anyone wants to have a chat with me. Um, while you've got Joe here, if anyone has any questions that you, you would like to ask Joe, please do. Um, but also, particularly for those people online, um, I know Daryl's going to make a topic in the Fossil Group Forum where we can continue the, the conversation and, and ask and answer questions there as well. I caught the first bit. Do I ever did I ever work with librarians before? Have you worked? Did you work with a school librarian before you worked with me? Had you worked with school librarians before? Not not in this capacity or or to this degree at all. No. So, so when when Jenny approached you, was what made you decide to open your classroom? Because you might need to explain this to Joe. Is that is that many of us? We approach teachers and, and it becomes that we'll give you some books, give us some time. What what check what made him open the door and go, okay, this sounds like a great idea? Yeah. Did, did you hear that, Joe? Or do you want me to repeat? Yeah, it? I got that. Thank you, Jenny. That's a really good question. I think it was I mean, it, it helped that Jenny had just done a teach meet, uh, which at the time was a regular weekly um event. And I think it was the respect for it was the respect for Jenny as the librarian and the respect for the work that herself and Daryl and the rest of the library team had already done on Fossil. And it was a light bulb moment where I realised that the sooner I get someone like Jenny to, to, to work with me and vice versa for me to work with Jenny, the sooner I would actually get better at delivering um, some better topics and, and better frameworks for my students. Um, I, there was definitely a light bulb moment at that teach meet. Um, and it helps. There was never there was never an element of 
I suppose, judgment or um, or transaction. I need this because I'm the teacher uh, or anything like that. There was a, there was that kind of respect for what we could both bring to the process. And I think it's also quite important. It maybe didn't come out in what we said that this collaboration took a long time. So we started designing that pressure groups unit in September to deliver it the following June. Um, so it took us a year to develop that unit. And within that time, we had a lot of time to meet and talk and build up trust, which I think made a big difference. Yes. The question is how, how did we get the school to give us the time to <laughs> collaborate? Um, we didn't. We found the time because it was important. Um, I th think that's as simple as that. Am I wrong, Jenny? <laughs> we, yeah, found, we made no, the time. No, you're right. Um, and Joe found times when he wasn't actively teaching. And I was lucky because we were a, a big team, so I didn't have to be on the desk at the front all the time. And we met in the in the early stages. We met for a period every week um, to sort this out um, in the context of a school like here, where I might need to be on the desk all the time. I, ha I have had times and I did with an economics teacher where I met with a teacher at the desk in the library while I was doing other stuff. So I think we did. We we realised it was important, and we we made time. I don't think the school did anything to give us extra time. That process you think, is the age of long fire. Has that then enabled the school to say, "Oh, okay, this is really valuable. So now we're going to give time." Does that work? I think that's a, cha a challenge in all schools. Um, so it has the kind of all the well, this is fine. But I think I think what so what is coming out of this is that um, because uh, what we were speaking about yesterday is that um, we as librarians um, we are integral to an educational process. Now it's quite clear that we are integral to this educational process, but we're not integral to an educational process where the teacher is standing in front telling the students what they need to know. Um, so the whole point of the the fossil group was to begin to build evidence um, that can be shared. So this talk that we've recorded now um, is there for people to point people to. But also I think um, Jenny and Joe will both agree that having made time to collaborate on this, um, there is already now a wealth of resource, mm. knowledge, expertise that can be recycled or repurposed um, that makes it much easier. And then colleagues begin to see. So as a consequence of this collaboration in politics, um, a really exciting collaboration developed in A-level economics mm. based on what Jenny and Joe were doing in politics. And the first year was really hard work. It was It was a lot of work for both of us. But then all the resources were in place and it just needed tweaking in the second year and the third year was even easier because we got the format that we wanted. So similarly to a subject department starting a new curriculum, the first year is really challenging. But then once we've got this in place effectively running itself, I can move on and, and work with somebody else to this level. I couldn't work with four or five departments to this level at the same time. It wouldn't work. It's also important to say that um, because Jenny taught me <laughs> too about how fossil can be utilised um, in my role as lead practitioner, I was able to go out and the school did make time for this. I was able to go into departments um, and talk to heads of department and go into department meetings and 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 use our inquiry and our essay planning wrap as a model for what they could do and collaborate on creating there. So we were speculating to accumulate at that early stage. Absolutely. OK, um, I might need to move on because I've got a deadline. I need to finish by 12 in order for Kevin to start. Um, so thank you very much, Joe. Thank I really Joe. appreciate that. Thanks for having me. Lovely to see you all.
So just while Jamie's doing that, um, so what we were trying to do was to share different approaches at making ourselves equal to an educational process. So this is finding a colleague in a subject who was interested in what we were doing and where a collaboration transformed what was happening in the classroom. But as librarians, we have opportunities to do research projects outside of the classroom. And that is another opportunity for us to demonstrate how we are integral to an educational process that may also lead to collaboration in the classroom. Um, so this is just a different perspective um, on how we might go about uh, making the library integral to the educational process. 